So China is the world's largest food importer. Now I'm going to refer to my notes um, for this video because I've got a lot of facts and figures that I want to tell you. So if you see me looking down at the screen, that is why. I mean, 2022, China imported about 146 million tons of grain and meat. China is the largest importer of meat globally in 2023. It imported over 2.74 million tonnes of beef. And they also import significant amounts of pork and chicken. And China is also the world's top importer of soybeans, accounting for about 60% of global soybean um, imports. And in 2023, China imported around 96 million tonnes of soybean. And if you look at the amount of business um, they do with the US from 2013 to 2022 they did about 153 billion dollars worth of imports of foods and grains from the US and in 2022 alone the US exports um, of agricultural products to China reached 36.4 billion dollars so that's a significant a proportion of US agricultural exports. So as you can see, US farmers rely pretty heavily on China as uh, their major customer. However, this is all about to change due to the trade war that was started by Trump. Though so China are increasingly turning to more friendlier nations to purchase their food and grain. And this is going to be a big problem, I think, for US farmers, as there is no other country with the purchasing power of China to replace that business. And in my opinion, actually the US has bought this all on themselves um, by imposing tariffs and restrictions onto China. So what we see is, China is increasingly doing business with more friendly nations outside of the Western nations. And they're doing more of that trade, especially with the BRICS nations. So if you look prior to 2018, the United States was the largest supplier of soybeans to China. In fact, the US dominated the Chinese soybean market for many years, often providing more than 35 million tons annually which accounted for over 40% of China's total soybean imports. However, since 2019, China has increasingly purchased soybeans from Brazil, which is a BRICS member. <clears throat> so if you look at 2022, Brazil accounted for about 60 to 70% of China's total soybean imports. And this dominance has grown steadily as a direct result of US-China trade war. In 2018-2019, um, it led China to reduce its reliance on the US soybeans and increase imports from Brazil. And another deciding factor is price. So if you look at farmers in the US, they're facing much higher production costs. And again, this is due to tariffs on Chinese goods. Many Countries outside of the West are able to buy machinery produced in China. And much of this machinery doesn't comply with US or EU strict regulations and is subject to tariffs. And it makes it unavailable to US farmers. Well, countries outside the US um, and Europe can purchase this cheaper farming equipment. And this lowers um, production costs. And then take beef, which is another significant import for China. The China have got a growing middle class and that's created a rising demand for high quality beef. However, Chinese importers are choosing more affordable sources to meet this demand. Historically, China purchased a majority of its beef from Australia and the US. However, in recent years, Brazil, Argentina and Uruguay have become major suppliers of Chinese beef, with Brazil accounting for between 40 and 45% of all of uh, China's beef imports. And it's also likely that the trade of grain and beef between China and Brazil um, is not being settled in US dollars and hence does not use the SWIFT payment system. In April 2023, 
China and Brazil signed an agreement to settle trade between the two countries in their own currencies. Hence, they no longer use the US dollar. This has an effect on the US dollar. Not only is it diminishing the use of the dollar in international trade, but it also, as a transaction, doesn't now need to go through US banks. The US, which for many years has had oversight on world trade data, is now losing the ability to see what is being traded and at what prices. So it's kind of a big blow to the US because for many years they because all these transactions for grain and foods have all gone through these US banks, they've been able to see data and know exactly who's buying what and how much they're paying. But as more and more countries now are moving away from the dollar because the US weaponizes the dollar, you see all the um, sanctions it's put on uh, Russia with regards to the dollar, more and more companies are thinking, hmm, maybe we don't want to be using American dollars. And I think you'll actually see more countries settling trade in their own currencies because of that. So now let's talk about Russia and China forming a new grain corridor on the Russian border and how this is going to affect the US because this is going to have big implications for the US. So China is the world's leading agricultural importer is currently diversifying its food strategy and a significant part of this is a partnership with Russia on the new land grain corridor, the NLGC. And it's an ambitious initiative that aims to create the world's first specialised railway grain terminal in Russia's Far East. As both countries seek to bolster their agricultural exports and reduce reliance on Western supply chains, the NLGC will have far-reaching implications for global food supply chains. So for China, It plays a critical role in enhancing their food security by diversifying imports and reducing the vulnerability to supply chain disruptions. Uh, It offers a direct overland route um, into Russia's vast grain reserves, especially wheat, which has become a priority as China seeks to reduce its reliance on Western suppliers like Australia, Canada, France and the US. So this grain corridor is expected to supply initially about 6 million tonnes of grain per year to China, which is still a fraction of its total grain imports, but it represents a significant um, switch from other countries to Russia. And Russia will benefit because, um, particularly as it faces Western sanctions following the Ukraine war, These sanctions have restricted its access to traditional markets in Europe, the Middle East and and North Africa. So this NLGC allows Russia to maintain and potentially increase its agricultural exports, not just to China, but to other Asian markets as well. And in 2023, Russia and China signed a $28.5 billion grain supply agreement, um, which covers the next 12 years. This agreement not only provides Russia with a stable market, but also strengthens its agricultural sector, particularly in the underdeveloped regions of the Far East, Urals and Siberia, where investments are expected to increase. One of the major logistical challenges um, that NLGC overcomes is the difference in rail track gauges between Russia and China. This has historically made direct rail transport difficult Um, To address this, Russia has constructed the grain terminal, which is a special facility designed to transfer grain between the two countries without the delays caused by the gauge changes. And this terminal was completed in 2022, and it significantly reduces the time that the uh, grain takes to transport from Russia to China. It previously took about three months and went by sea. And with the annual capacity of 8 million tonnes, um, it's expandable to 16 million tonnes. And the terminal will greatly enhance the trade between Russia and China for grain. But much more than the logistical improvements, the NLGC is strategically important for China's long-term food security. China has been steadily increasing its food imports due to rising demand. Basically, the country's getting richer and people are eating more food than they used to. 
Um, and despite being a major wheat producer, China still is the world's largest wheat importer. And that's down to some environmental factors like droughts and floods that actually curtail China's own wheat production. But the NLGC allows China to import more Russian wheat and that helps to stabilize um, the supply and reduce dependence on um, distant suppliers, particularly those in Western countries. And the, the NLGC aligns with China's broader strategy of avoiding choke points in global food supply chains. There's a lot of um, think tank reports in America that one way if America come into a war with China, they will, they will close some of these choke points um, like the Suez Canal, the Panama Canal and the Straits, especially the Straits of Malacca, uh, the Malacca Straits. And these choke points are essential for transport of grain and other agricultural products from major exporters like Brazil, Argentina to China. So due to these rising geopolitical tensions, China is increasingly concerned about the security of the supply routes. And hence, um, this supply route is an overland um, supply route from Russia to China. And it's not vulnerable to these choke points. So it ensures a more stable food supply for China. And Russia also stands to gain economically, particularly that it will see increased um, Chinese investments in its agricultural sector. And this blow my mind, there's over 200,000 Chinese farmers have resettled in Russia's Far East. And more than 200 Chinese companies have made significant agricultural investments in the region. And this Chinese capital and expertise is expected to boost agricultural production. And, uh, you know, the, the area that this is happening in Russia has, has, has lacked adequate infrastructure in the past. But with this Chinese investment, this infrastructure is going to get better and better. And as Russia looks to expand its agricultural exports, the NLGC will play a key role in increasing the volume of grains, particularly wheat, barley and soybeans that will be coming through that route into China. And in the broader context of global food security, the NLGC has the potential to shift trade flows in favour of China and Russia, reducing the influence of traditional grain exporters like the US, Canada and Australia. So this is going to have a big effect on US farmers. As I said earlier, there's no other customer anywhere near the size of China. So, you know, US farmers are either going to have to grow less crops which will affect their income or try to find new markets. Uh, so by establishing a secure overland route for grain and other agricultural products, the NLGC could challenge the dominance of Western exporters in key markets such as Southeast Asia and South Asia. So Russia not only are planning to supply um, China through this new grain corridor, but other Southeast Asian countries as well. So for Western countries, it could mean a need for them to diversify their export markets and strengthen trade relationships with other major uh, grain and food importers so they can remain competitive, um, you know, amidst this growing cooperation between Russia and China. I mean, it's a absolutely a win-win situation you know Russia can ramp up its production of, of grains and, and other foods that may have a ready-made customer right next door to them in China so it, it's really good in conclusion the new land grain corridor represents a strategic partnership between China and Russia that offers both countries significant benefits for China it strengthens food security and diversifies their sources and uh, for Russia, it provides a stable market for their exports, boosts their economic development in the far east of Russia, which has generally been um, underdeveloped in the past. And as this corridor continues to develop, um, you know, global food trade will be affected and it will affect Western countries with long term implications for the balance of, you know, agricultural supply chains 
And the other thing um, I'd like to mention is BRICS, which now includes Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Iran, Egypt, Ethiopia, and the United Arab Emirates. And they're basically putting together um, a grain um, exchange uh, where this will mean that all of those countries will trade their grain and other food stuffs between each other um, in their own currencies, completely bypassing the uh, US dollar. So many of these transactions that were previously, um, you know, traded on the Chicago uh, exchange, I think it's a Chicago exchange, um, or one of the exchanges in the US anyway, they will no longer be seen by the US. They will no longer pass through US banks. So US banks can't make profit on those trades. Um, but the other thing, the US will start to not know what's going on so much in the market, i.e. the amounts being traded, who are the buyers, who are the sellers, and how much that um, trade is going for. So from what I can see, this is sort of real bad news for US farmers. Not only are they uh, coming under increased input price pressure, so their exports will be more expensive, but they're actually losing oversight on a lot of the world's grain trade. So that's, that's my thing. I mean, I, I strongly believe that if the US hadn't have started this trade war, you know, they're putting a lot of sanctions on China, a lot of tariffs on stuff, a lot of sanctions on tech products that China would still be buying a lot from the US. So I think in conclusion that, you know, I think America have really bought this on themselves. Anyway, let me know what you think down in the comments. But as always, until the next one, for now, take care.